angry protesters returned to Washington. As tensions rose, the Secret Service ringed the White House with a barricade of buses. It was like living in a bunker in the White House. I mean, you'd look out in the streets and see thousands of people protesting. You literally were afraid for your life. It, there were times when I can remember saying, I can't believe this is the United States of America, a free country. And we, here we are in the White House with barricades up and buses around the White House and tear gas going off and thousands, hundreds of thousands of protesters out in the streets and troops sitting here. An embattled Nixon faced the press as anti-war demonstrators continued to flock to Washington. Captain. What do you think the students are trying to say in these demonstrations? They're trying to say that they want peace. Uh, they're trying to say that uh, they want to stop the killing. They're trying to say that they want to end the draft. They're trying to say that we ought to get out of Vietnam. I agree with everything that they're trying to accomplish. I believe, however, that the decisions that I have made will serve that purpose. That night, protesters circled the White House with chants and candles. Inside, a sleepless Nixon made more than 40 phone calls to friends and supporters around the country. Near dawn, he called for a car and asked to be driven to the Lincoln Memorial, where protesters had gathered. White House aide Eagle Krog followed him. It was, I guess it was a, almost a surreal atmosphere. It was almost like dreamlike. Is this really happening? Uh, walking up the stairs of the Lincoln Memorial, and there was the president. Uh, sort of standing in the middle of a group of uh, young people who were wearing uh, combat fatigues with peace symbols and bandanas and with all of the uh, clothing of the, of the, of the 60s and, and the 70s and trying very hard to, to communicate to them. I think I said, well, what are you going to do about the Kent State killings? What are you going to do about the war? Um, he said, I'm really not here to talk about that right now. Uh, we're trying to handle things. So it was a one-way you know, conversation or a one-way street, you know, because he was there trying to be very conversational and casual, and we were there outraged and angry and scared. One student uh, basically told him, he said, I hope that you realize that we are willing to die for what we believe in. And I think, so recall, the president's response was, well, I understand that, but we're trying to build a world where people will not have to, to die for what they believe in. the guest of honor at a Billy Graham crusade in Tennessee, Nixon had been in office 16 months. A majority of Americans still backed his Vietnam policy, but the furor over Cambodia had deepened the divisions Nixon had promised to mend. Even here, surrounded by thousands who supported him, the president could not escape the ceaseless storm of protest. people together as we must bring them together if we're going to have peace in the world if our young people are going to have a fulfillment beyond simply those material things they must turn to those great spiritual sources that have made America the great country that it is I'm proud to be here and I'm very proud to have your warm reception thank you very much 
us sing together, God bless America, my home sweet home. God Throughout the next year, Nixon continued to try to rally his supporters while denouncing his opponents, calling some among the protesters thugs and hoodlums, blaming his critics in Congress and the press for failing to support the war. All U.S. troops left Cambodia by the end of June, as Nixon had promised. He insisted that the military action which had caused such turmoil had eased the pressure on the troops in Vietnam. Withdrawals continued on schedule, but more American lives had been lost. There was no breakthrough in the peace talks. And in the White House, an increasingly frustrated and suspicious Nixon urged intensified surveillance of the anti-war movement. He grew distrustful even of his closest advisors, and installed hidden microphones in his own office, in part so that his aides could not later claim to have disagreed with his decisions. But the taping system would eventually trap the president himself. On 12, 1971, the White House staff prepared for a wedding in the Rose Garden. The president's elder daughter, Tricia, was to be married to a young law student, Edward Cox. Rain threatened the ceremony, and Nixon spent much of the afternoon on the phone to Air Force weathermen. Finally, there was a prediction of a 15-minute break in the weather. I gotta get dressed. <laughs> I know, I gotta get to see all my things, my hair done. <laughs> I saw the president more relaxed and more happy and more uh, like a typical American father than I've seen him in a long, long time. He looks like he was doing a great job out on the dance floor, too. Yes, and he doesn't dance all that often, you know. It was a day that all of us will remember, Nixon later wrote, because we were beautifully and simply happy. The next morning, Nixon picked up the New York Times. In the left corner was an account of Trisha's wedding. Across the page was another headline. The first installment of what came to be called the Pentagon Papers. A secret Defense Department study which revealed past government deception about the war in Vietnam. Daniel Ellsberg, a former Defense Department employee who had turned against the war, had given the top secret documents to the press. I can no longer cooperate in concealing this information from the American public. Although the Pentagon Papers contained nothing about the Nixon policy in Vietnam, it was a leak of enormous magnitude. The President and Henry Kissinger saw it as a disturbing precedent and a threat to their secret diplomacy. There was panic in the White House. And I remember being in meetings with Henry Kissinger that day in which he said this could cause the collapse of American foreign policy. Uh, this could undermine our initiatives with China and the Soviet Union. And don't forget that at that time, people did not know that we were negotiating secretly with the Chinese. They did not also know that we were conducting secret negotiations with the North Vietnamese to end the war in Vietnam. And so a lot of things were going on that we knew that the public didn't. Just five weeks later, the Times published another leak, this one potentially damaging to Nixon's foreign policy. It revealed U.S. negotiating tactics in upcoming arms talks with the Soviets, and it seemed to confirm Nixon's worst fears about the press. I had seen him angry in meetings in the past, but I had never experienced uh, this kind of fury, where he was basically walking around the, the room, slamming his fist in his hand, saying that this cannot be tolerated. We cannot let this go on. Nixon became obsessive about the press coverage. We had a daily news summary that was prepared by 
young man in the White House. By the time I got to the White House, the president had already read it and had marked on the columns. Uh, John Chancellor last night said this, respond today, uh, call up so-and-so, uh, look at this, you can't trust these people. Uh, Newsweek has done it to us again. I'd get Nixon's news summary with all these comments down the side. And so you had the idea when you went to work in the morning, you were going to war with the press. A sense of being under siege pervaded the White House, fueled by the leaks, the constant anti-war demonstrations, and intensifying criticism in the press. In this atmosphere of us versus them, Colson's office began an ever-expanding list of Nixon's critics, the enemies list. Its object was to screw our political enemies. Reporters and politicians, educators and entertainers were barred from the White House. Some were targeted for tax audits. Others were trailed by private detectives. And it was very shortly thereafter that Nixon authorized the plumbers, the creation of a special group to stop leaks, and they began to take extra legal steps and put into motion the mechanism which ultimately resulted in the downfall of the administration. In a White House memo regarding the neutralization of Daniel Ellsberg, the plumbers discussed how they might destroy his public image and credibility. In search of damaging information about Ellsberg's private life, they arranged a break-in at the office of his psychiatrist. They apparently broke a window on the way in, and realizing that it could no longer be viewed as a covert operation, uh, changed courses and decided to make it look as if it had been uh, entered by a burglar uh, looking for drugs or some other substances. Basically, they smashed up the office, took pictures of the damage. I was shocked at these pictures. Went to see John Ehrlichman. He was, if anything, more shocked than I was and said, uh, shut it down as of now. The plumbers were eventually disbanded but some of the agents were reassigned to work behind the scenes for the newly formed committee to re-elect the president. Re-election had become Nixon's consuming concern. From the first day of his presidency, he had fought to hold on to his silent majority and had shaped his domestic policies in part to win their votes. But those voters were slipping away. Unemployment and inflation were up. Racial divisions had deepened. And still, week after week, the dead came home from Vietnam. Nixon's popularity had fallen so low that he had begun to fear he would not even be renominated in 1972. Good evening. The 37th President of the United States, Richard M. Nixon, is in China, the first American chief executive ever to visit the world's most populous country. On February 18, 1972, Richard Nixon began still another remarkable comeback with a stunning foreign policy success. President Nixon's motorcade is now sweeping toward the city of Peking. Here comes the motorcade now, as you see. The world watched as Richard Nixon drove through a city that few outsiders had seen for nearly a quarter of a century. He knew, said the New York Times, that for this journey, no matter what else occurred, he would always be remembered. That afternoon, Nixon was abruptly summoned to see Mao Zedong, American television was unaware of the meeting. The only coverage was by Chinese cameramen with black and white film. This encounter between Nixon, the career anti-communist, and Chairman Mao, the leader of the largest communist revolutionary movement in history, shocked Nixon's old conservative allies. They accused him of surrendering to international communism. But for Nixon, it was all part of his global strategy. By visiting China, he was beginning to exploit the divisions in the communist world.
One of Nixon's primary objectives in opening up with China was to give him more leverage with the Soviet Union. These relations were essentially stalled, but soon after the opening with China, the Soviet Union became much more flexible on several fronts. They agreed to a summit meeting with us in 1972, and they began to be more reasonable on various arms control issues. Nixon enjoyed the power gain, uh, probably as much as any president in modern times. He played it very hard and very cleverly and very carefully in the world scene. And he was always thinking strategically, and that's one of the qualities uh, that someone has to have in foreign policy. I mean, you cannot make decisions in foreign policy based on today's circumstance. You've got to think about its ramifications for 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And it's like a chess player. You're anticipating six moves ahead if you're a good chess player. In the spring of 1972, the North Vietnamese suddenly launched a massive offensive. South Vietnam's forces were overwhelmed. Thousands fled. If the offensive were not stopped, the war would be lost, and with it, Nixon feared the presidency. But if he ordered a U.S. counterattack, the Soviets might cancel the upcoming arms control summit in Moscow, a vital part of Nixon's grand design. Most of his advisors urged Nixon not to take any action that might jeopardize the summit. Once again, Nixon overruled them. His view was that it would be embarrassing for him to go to Moscow without responding to North Vietnamese aggression, that he would look weak. He's talking to Soviet leaders who are providing arms to the North Vietnamese troops who are killing American troops. So he didn't think the summit was worth it unless he could also show that he was strong within Vietnam itself. Nixon ordered the most drastic escalation of the war since 1968. Massive, sustained bombing of Hanoi and the mining of Haiphong Harbor, risking a full-scale confrontation with the Soviets by putting their supply ships in peril. After explaining his decision to the American people, he made a direct appeal to the Kremlin. Our two nations have made significant progress in our negotiations in recent months. We are near major agreements on nuclear arms limitation, on trade, on a host of other issues. Let us not slide back toward the dark shadows of a previous age. We do not ask you to sacrifice your principles or your friends, but neither should you permit Hanoi's intransigence to blot out the prospects we together have so patiently prepared. Nixon's gamble paid off. The Soviets did not cancel the summit. On May 22, 1972, Richard Nixon became the first American president ever to set foot inside the Kremlin. Nixon had done what none of his predecessors had been able to do. He had negotiated a treaty in which the two superpowers agreed to slow an arms race that had been accelerating for more than a quarter of a century. It was his greatest achievement. Two days later, five burglars working for the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon entered the Watergate complex in Washington. They broke into the office of the Democratic National Committee, placed bugs on the telephones, and made their escape. But the microphones failed to work. 
they would have to go back. The President of the United States. Nixon returned from Moscow in triumph. He had almost completed the withdrawal of American forces from Vietnam, opened the door to China, and signed the first nuclear arms limitation treaty since the dawn of the atomic age. He had often said that all he wanted was a life with one more victory than defeat. Now that victory, a second term as president, seemed his for the asking. Five men wearing white gloves and carrying cameras were caught early today in the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in Washington. They apparently were unarmed, and nobody knows yet why they were there. But I don't think that's the last we're going to hear of this story. Five men wearing white gloves and carrying cameras were caught early today in the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in Washington. They were caught by a night watchman and they did not resist arrest when the police came. They apparently were unarmed and nobody knows yet why they were there. The film and the camera hadn't even been exposed. In any case, they're being held. On Sunday morning, June 18th, Richard Nixon later wrote, I left for Key Biscayne. When I got to my house, I could smell coffee brewing in the kitchen, and I went in to get a cup. There was a Miami Herald on the counter, and I glanced over the front page. The main headline was about the Vietnam withdrawals. There was a small story in the middle of the page on the left-hand side. The Watergate Apartment Hotel office complex in Washington has a fortress-like appearance. But the burglars penetrated that security. Four of the men arrested were Cuban nationals now living in Miami. And the fifth, James McCord, was a former FBI and CIA agent, recently employed as a security aide by the Republican National Committee and the Committee to Re-elect the President. Presidential Press Secretary Ron Ziegler today called the incident a third-rate burglary and nothing the President would be concerned with. president was concerned. On June 23rd, he met with his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman. Now, on the investigation, you know, the thing, we're back to the problem the FBI is not under control. To thwart the FBI investigation, Haldeman suggested that the break-in could be made to look like a CIA operation. And that will fit rather well because the FBI agents who are working the case at this point feel that's what it is. This is the FBI. There is no evidence that Nixon had ordered the break in, but his aides had. The president approved the plan to divert the FBI. I saw Watergate as politics pure and simple, Nixon wrote in his memoirs. We were going to play it tough. I never doubted that was exactly how the other side would have played it. Richard Nixon pulled it into the White House. He couldn't leave it alone. And so within a week after the break-in, or maybe two weeks, he had personally involved himself in the intrigue of the whole thing. So Nixon sealed his fate six days after the break-in. four years earlier, Nixon now wanted to win the biggest landslide in presidential history. Tonight, 
I again proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. And let us pledge ourselves to win an even greater victory this November in 1972. Nixon's campaign amassed huge sums of money. Skillful television ads appealed to Democrats, blue-collar workers, the South. Nixon had always campaigned hard for other Republicans. Now he abandoned them, even dropped the party label. Richard Nixon campaigned as the president. You're great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, you're great. Hi. <laughs> as the president pursued victory, the White House continued to deny involvement in Watergate. A few reporters followed the story, but most voters dismissed the break-in as a campaign caper. Watergate never threatened Nixon's big win. Nixon overwhelmed his Democratic rival, Senator George McGovern. He carried every state but Massachusetts. But his victory was not complete. The Democratic opposition retained control of both the House and the Senate. It turned out to be a lonely landslide. He monopolized all of the resources, all of the money, all of the political talent in the Republican Party and anything else that he could annex for his own personal victory and didn't share the wealth and the opportunity with his party. It was an extraordinarily selfish victory in my view we are showing president nixon at this hour on election night nixon watched the returns with two of his closest aides chief of staff hr haldeman and special counsel chuck colson and i couldn't feel any sense of jubilation it was just sort of a a very depressed atmosphere in the room and here we were supposedly winning and it was more like we'd lost and it was more, the attitude was kind of, well, we showed him we got even with our enemies and, and uh, we beat him. Instead of we've been given a wonderful mandate to rule over the next four years, there was, we were reduced to our, our petty worst on the night of what should have been our greatest triumph. And that's indicative of kind of the paradox of the Nixon years. I'm at a loss to explain the melancholy that settled over me on that victorious night. Nixon later wrote. To some extent, the marring effects of Watergate may have played a part. To some extent, our failure to win Congress. And to a greater extent, the fact that we had not been able to end the war in Vietnam. Whatever the reasons, I allowed myself only a few minutes to reflect on the past. I was confident that a new era was about to begin. The next morning after the election, Nixon came in the cabinet room, the cabinet, some of the White House staff were there, but he stood and applauded, and he sat down and immediately wanted to get down to work. And work was, by golly, we're going to change this government, and everybody's going to give me his resignation. Bob Haldeman here will tell you what I have in mind where that's concerned. I thank you all for your support. You did a wonderful job. I appreciate it. And he got up and left. And then Haldeman got up and said, the president wants everybody's resignation. And this hit like a cold slap in the face. It wasn't intended that way. Uh, what, he, uh, what he wanted to do was to give his second, get a, his, have his second administration start fresh, a fresh beginning. Nixon left Washington and for the next two months remained in virtual isolation. One constantly has the problem of either getting on top of the job or having the job get on top of you. Uh, I find that up here on top of the mountain, it is easier for me to get on top of the job. This was a period that is so Nixonian. I mean, you could just focus on that and say, this is the essence of the man. Instead of savoring the victory, instead of reaching out and embracing people, he withdrew within himself. 
on his mountaintop, Nixon brooded over the issue that had haunted his first term and now threatened his second, the war in Vietnam. The Paris peace talks were again stalled. Re-elected by an overwhelming margin, he now resolved to use...